we are looking at Dante to celebrate 700th anniversary. Now, uh, today we are looking at uh, Inferno. I think we're covering 13 through 23. Uh, the format is as follows. We're going to have, we're going to ask an open question for everybody. What did they get from their reading? We have a whole bunch of people reading with us. Um, and everybody is you know, welcome to share what they got from it. That's going to be the first part. In the middle, it, in this, during the first part, we're going to have three long presentations uh, by Rosella, Doug, and Phil on different aspects that people might not have thought of. But we want to hear from you. Okay, so please line up to talk about what you're getting so far, because by talking about it is the best way you can get most out of this person. Um, now, Rosella has. I must say, my. Um... Um, data wrong because I, I thought we were doing from 10. Sure, that's fine. That's fine. Rizella, you, as I said, you are marinated in Dante. Anything you talk about Dante, people just love. Okay, so you can talk about anything about Dante. So it's, it's completely carte blanche for you. Thank okay. you. Okay, wonderful. Hi. So what, what we're going to do is that after the presentations, we're going to go into breakout rooms where we can discuss amongst ourselves. And then when we come back, you get to put the most important question you have on your mind on the table. And then you will have everybody answering those questions. So we'll collect all the questions and then we're going to do a lightning round of the questions. So that's the format for today. And we're going to start with Rosella. You know, we're really fortunate to have Rosella who has been teaching Dante for many, 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 many years. Um, so Rosella, welcome. Floor is yours. Thanks. So um, when we started uh, the Inferno and uh, we talked about, you know, the division of the Inferno um, and there was uh, the uh, dark forest and the vestibule, then what is called in English, upper hell and, and nether hell. Um, when you get to uh, the sixth circle, it, they kind of like suspended in between um, the upper hell, which is the last important sins and nether hell of the sins of uh, violence and sins of fraud. Um, and Dante separates the heretics um, and puts them in uh, um, hell because they denied the existence of uh, uh, life after death. And therefore by denying the existence of life after death is the denial of, of God in Christ. However, he puts into Canto 10 um, some very, very important figures um, like uh, Farinata degli Uberti, Cavalcante dei Cavalcanti. Farinata was the leader of the, of the Ghibelline in Florence um, from 1240 to his death, which was in 1266. Um, Cavalcante dei Cavalcanti was the leader of the Guelph. Um, we um, know that the, the Florence was a city divided uh, in between the Guelphs and, and the Ghibelline. And um, so before Dante even starts to write the Divine Comedy, uh, the Guelph and the Ghibelline were always um, in such bitter battles. Um, and they were always um, kicking each other out of Florence. And then, and then some, somehow they would make a comeback and the other one got would kick out. And um, so Farinata degli Uberti is a, an enemy of Dante, even though Dante never met him because he was born in 1265, uh, because he was of the opposite. Um, Dante's father was a Guelph and um, um, Farinata was the leader of the Ghibellines. The Ghibellines wanted 
a, an emperor to lead Italy, remember. It's sort of like what the white Guelph became after, all right? Um, so the, the most important thing in, in Canto 10 is what, what is heresy, okay? And why do they, these people deserve to be punished so harshly? Well, um, the heretic in Canto 10 were all people who had um, different ideas of what life, it, whether it didn't exist uh, after death or they didn't believe at all. Or, and, and another biggest big character that Dante meets in Canto 10 towards the end is Frederick II. He was the king of Sicily and he was the one who started the Sicilian school. So Dante felt attracted to him by, um, not only because Dante wanted an emperor, but because he um, uh, had taken the poetic of the Sicilian school uh, in the Dolce Villanova school and then adapted to his own poetic, you know? So I think I talked about how Dante has wears many hats in, in the Divine Comedy. So he's the narrator, he's the pilgrim, he's the, uh, the student, the um, uh, judge, jury, and so on and so forth. So in Canto 10, it becomes really important you know, how, um, of the role of Virgil. They are inside the city of Dis. This means devil. So they have entered the, you know, the realm of the devil. And Virgil becomes more and more his um, voice of reason. So he is beautiful in Canto 10 how he asks Virgil questions and then Virgil answers him, but you know, it's Dante doing all of these roles intertwined. You have three lines in which he's the narrator, three lines in which he's the pilgrim, three lines in which he's the student, three lines in which he's Virgil and, and you have to like kind of weave through it. So I just wanted to read um, a couple of line um, from Canto 10 when he says, um, oh, power supreme that through these impious circles turnest me, I began as pleases thee, speak to me and my longing satisfy. So he, he was very, very um, kiss ass, so to speak, to Virgil um, and say, oh, supreme, or you know. Tell me what is going on here. And then it's Virgil who answers, the people who are lying in these tombs, may be, they be seen, already are uplifted, that covers all, and no one keep it guard. Dante sees these uh, tombs. They open. They have uh, the tombstone is behind, um, it's in the front. Okay, laying on the on the side, and the flames are coming out of these tombs, and he's afraid to look in. Okay, and then Virgil tells him they all will be closed up when the Jehoshaphat they shall return here with the bodies they have left above. In other words, at the end of uh, after the last judgment, those covers will be they will collect their bodies and the covers will close and the punishment will become much more um, potent because now they have their bodies and their soul and the, they don't have any respite because the, the tombs are, are, will be closed, okay? And so it goes on as Virgil will tell them who they are, you know, and, um, and he's like, walking very fearful beyond, behind um, Virgil when all of a sudden he hears a voice, a thundering voice. 
Oh, Tuscan, thou through the city of fire ghost alive, thus speaking modestly, be pleased to stay thy footstep in this place. Thy mode of speaking makes thee manifest a native of the noble fatherland to which perhaps I too molested was. So this guy recognizes Dante by the Florentine tone uh, of his voice. And just like in life, he, uh, he was this fiery um, general um, known to be very, very um, tough and very, very uh, demanding. He is demands of Dante, uh, what is he doing there and who is his family? By asking him who his family was, Dante reintroduces the theme of how important it was in the Middle Ages to have family relations in politics, okay? And when you he will hear who Dante is, he might be like, uh, you know, Dante was of the uh, low uh, nobility, if, en if any, and it's like, oh yeah, whatever, you know, he wasn't much um, interested in that. Um, the contrapasso, you guys know what the contrapasso is? Uh, please go ahead and explain. The contrapasso is Dante's law of punishment. Uh, for each uh, condemned, uh, for each uh, condemned soul, according to their sin, he devises a punishment that it's either the mirror image of that punishment or the exact opposite, okay? So the punishment of the heretics is a little bit complex because at first look, you will see them in these fiery tombs, right? And later on in the canto, um, we learn that they suffer from, um, and I don't know if I say this in English correctly, hyper, because um, I know it in Italian and now I got to translate it. Hyperopia, am I saying it? To, uh, um, I don't know if it, an English word. Hyperopia okay. means uh, farsightedness. Phil, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, we are, I was going to just say farsightedness, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. So these souls are able to see the future, but they're not able to see the present. And every time, you know, the years go by, they will forget what they knew and they will always continue to know the future, but they will never know uh, the present. And they don't, rem uh, but they do remember the past. So that's, um, because they denied the um, continuation of life after death. Uh, so, and they only lived in the present. Now their punishment is to not remember the present. And so like other souls are, um, have knowledge of what their loved ones are doing on earth, of what other people are doing on earth. The, uh, the um, heretics do not. Um, Farinata and Cavalcante, um, and by Cavalcante, I mean Cavalcante Cavalcanti, who is, was Guido's father. Am I making sense? I don't want to. Yep, go ahead. Guido was Dante's best friend and a poet of the Dolce Stil Novo. And, uh, they were Epicurean, okay? Ep Epicurean was uh, an ancient philosopher that lived between three, 341 and 270 BC. And he believed in living pleasantly, um, having a life of doctrine, but, but of pleasure, serenity and, um, um, and to achieve the highest 
passion about anything in life. But he also thought that there was no afterlife. And Epicurean believed in a nutshell, you know, it's very complex, but in a nutshell, that when people died, the molecule dispersed into the universe to replenish the universe. So they were denier of, you know, the religion, um, whether it was a monotheistic religion or, uh, or polytheistic religion, they were denier of the um, life after death. And um, Frederick II was a, a very well-known Epicurean and uh, Farinata de Liberti and Guido Cavalcanti were as well. Now, Dante starts to talk to uh, Farinata and the two of them start to kind of have a little fight of, um, you know, about the Guelph and the Ghibelline and who kicked that who and, and this and that and the other thing. And um, there is one part that's very, very important about Farinata. Farinata in 1960, kicked out the Guelph from Florence. And since it had been at the end of a very, very bloody battle, the Ghibellines of Florence wanted to um, burn to the ground all of the property of the Guelph so that they would never come back into Florence. And Farinata was the only one out of all the generals uh, that said that he was a Florentine first and a Ghibelline second. And he fought to keep Florence, um, you know, from being burned to the ground. Later on, he pays the price because when he dies, he's buried with his wife um, and when the wealth make it back to Florence, they inter his body and his wife's body, and they burn the bones um, of the two of them. So the punishment is kind of like of what happens to them. You know, they don't have a resting ground and they were burned. And he was the one that, that saved Florence from being burned. And this is also the first time that we see fire in hell. Many people, when they read the Inferno, they go by the uh, religious theologians um, knowledge of, uh, of, of what hell is, you know, fiery hell, we're all gonna burn and we're all gonna, you know, suffer tremendously, but uh, the, um, Throughout the inferno, um, fire is not very much present. Um, there is in Canto 10, it will be in Canto 15 with the rain of fire. There was, will be others, but it's really not that much present. He's the, he devises a whole lot of other punishments, but not so much fire, um, you know, contrary to popular belief. So as he's talking and he's having this tit for tat with Dante, and now Dante all of a sudden, he's no longer the student and oh my God, oh Supreme, he is talking to Farinata with a very um, you know, tough tone. It's like, oh yeah, you kicked them out, but then they came back in three years and kicked your ass out and blah, blah, blah. You know, and he's being like, sarcastic when all of a sudden so when farinata comes out of the tomb he comes out full force with his chest out you know you could uh like a general who are you a tuscan right with a voice booming and we think that he was on his tippy toes in the in the tomb because you see him from the belly button up right? But then all of a sudden, this other soul 
comes out, but he has a very pleasant tone, a very more like somber tone, but we only see him from the chest up. And he addresses Dante um, because he recognizes Dante from being his son's friend. And so he says to him, he said, if it's by lofty, let me find it, hold on. I can't find the. <laughs> But in any case, he said, if you are here by loftiness of genius, if you find the lines, I, I remember the words loftiness of genius, okay? Uh, why is it my, where is my son? So he's looking around for, for Guido because Guido was Dante's best friend and a member of the Stilnova school. He was an Epicurean, he was well-read, he was an erudite learner. He spoke Greek, Latin, Arabic, and all, you know, and, and then some. And so he's like, if you're here by loftiness of genius, so here is Dante the Dante, who says, eh, you know, I'm a genius. He's putting those words in, in, in people's mouths. Like, oh, look at me, loftiness of genius, right? And he's like, so Dante, Dante hesitates. And Cavalcanti takes the hesitation of Dante and the fact that he doesn't see Guido, that Guido is dead. Now, when Dante's writing this in 1306, 1307, Guido is dead. Guido died in August of 1300 when Dante was prior, and he was one of the seven priors that had to vote about kicking the Guelph out of Florence, the Black Guelph. And when he was kicked out of Florence, he contracted malaria in a marshland and died. So Dante feels very responsible for the death of his best friend. So at this point, Dante again becomes the student and he turns to Virgil as like, why is he asking me about his son? Because in March of 1300, when he um, starts when he puts the, you know, the travel in, Guido is alive. Do you understand what I'm saying? Guido died in August. The trip starts on March 25th um, of the year 1300. Okay, so he's like, why doesn't he know that? And so Virgil explains to Dante that the, the a supplement to their punishment is that they don't see the present. They can only see the future. But they will forget that future. Like let's say they this year's 2021 and they and they can see 2023. But as they get closer to 2023, they will not remember what they knew. And then they will be able to see 2026, 25, you know, you get my idea? And but Cavalcante is not like tough, like Farinata. He's more um, the father figure, you know, who's, he takes Dante's um, astonishment uh, to think that the uh, Guido is dead and he, goes back into the tombs and he doesn't get up anymore, okay? And Farinata, and if I could only find the, Farinata goes back up from the tomb as if Cavalcante never, never came out and continued where he had just left off. 
And then they continue the, you know, to talk about the, you know, the Guelph and the Ghibelline and, and, and all that. And, um, and so Canto, Canto uh, 10 is also very important. Why are Farinata and Cavalcante within the same tomb? Although they were mortal enemies, they were Guelph and Ghibelline. Guido, Guido, who was Cavalcante's son, married Beatrice degli Uberti, who was Farinata's daughter, for the good of the, um, of the city of Florence. This marriage was proposed for the good of the city of Florence, didn't do much, but um, they were, uh, what do you call it, in-laws some kind of, you know? They were the father-in-laws. And so they're punished within the same tomb because Dante wants to point out that relationships were very, very important in politics, social issues, government, and all the, uh, all the rest that was important for the life of Florence, Italy, the world, uh, what have you. Uh, so it is a very, very important canto, uh, not only by the three people that he does need, uh, but by the fact that he talks about these family relations, okay? Um, the other, um, Frederick II was the last um, hope that Italy had of being united under an emperor, a Roman emperor. He was crowned uh, emperor in Rome in 1220, but he was an enemy of the, you know, they were crowned by the Pope, right? But he was an enemy of the church. He did not really get along with the popes and he was excommunicated in 1227 and 1245 by two different popes. Yeah, two different popes there. And then he died in 1250 and with him died the, um, the hope that Italy had that the kingdom of Sicily would expand and unite the entire country. Manfred, Frederick II's son, uh, took over after Frederick II, but he didn't have the, the you know, toughness and spunk and, and the, you know, the political um, ideology that the father had. And so that was, that's one of the, the reason why he puts, um, you know, uh, he, he puts them in there because it's the political canto per eccellenza. Do you know what that means? Nope. For um, per eccellenza means the the most political canto, mm -hmm. perhaps in the all inferno. It all it, it is all about the wealth, the Ghibelline, the 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 um, idea of an emperor that died in, in mm -hmm. the 13th century, uh, Italy that was divided, shambled, um, battles everywhere, people being exiled, uh, being killed. And don't forget that Dante himself was accused of heresy because the Pope had to think of something to, you know, he was uh, accused of, because he wanted to, convince Bonifacio VIII to never let the French prince into um, the territory of Tuscany and, but the Pope wanted to. And so he uh, condemned him of heresy. So that was one of the things that kept Dante away from Florence for uh, 20 years. Well, wow. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Rosella. I really appreciate well, Really appreciate Any this. Any questions? Uh, what we will because do is I we will... Have to go. yes, I know. Um, uh, Rosella, 
really appreciate you coming on Easter. I know this was tough for you, but thank you very much. It's always wonderful to have you. We'll see you next if month. If I can connect in the last half hour, I'll try. But, Please. Um, yeah. Wonderful. All right. Okay, okay folks. Uh, so uh, now with, with this great start by Rosella, now it's everybody else's turn to talk about what they are getting from their reading of Dante. So we're going to start with Joe, then Maxine, Vanessa, and Jess, Jason. Uh, give me just a second, Joe. Oh, let me go ahead. Yes, uh, Joe. Yes, yeah, so I'm not going to have as detailed as a uh, presentation as uh, Rosella just had. Um, but in reading this portion of the uh, uh, these 10 cantas that uh, um, we were uh, covering for this reading, uh, the thing that I actually took the most out of it was the idea of how suicide and how he viewed suicide was interesting to me. Um, because suicide at one point had been seen as a honorable thing to do. And that's a kind of a, it's changed. It's it turned into a profound shift and now it's an offense against God. And Dante incorporates that into acts of violence into the, some of the deepest parts of hell. Uh, and that it's an actually a act against natural law. And I, I find that that to be, um, and it, that it's an act against the community that, and that the person that actually committed suicide lived a very good life for the most part, just couldn't deal with the certain circumstances with Frederick II. Uh, this other thing that stuck out to me in this in these cantos was the when he ran in with uh, Bernuto, Bernuto Latini, his mentor, and there was this genuine connection that I felt like when I was reading it that they, you know, that he was very appreciative of what he had done and very appreciative of, uh, of, um, of Dante himself and even referred to him as in the lectures, uh, his, as his son on a couple of different occasions. And that was, a, that was very interesting to me because I, I felt like Dante through this entire journey, you could see his emotions running high and low when he's, as he's seeing different people uh, as he goes through the depths of hell, you know, goes through the various circles of hell. Uh, the last part that really stuck out to me that was interesting is the use of popes and having them in hell as well. I thought that that was an incredibly powerful thing, that especially the way he depicted them. Uh, and it was, what it really said is that that we're not above reproach. And that's a really powerful thing at that point in time in Italy. I, it's, it gives you, so I, I, what I'm getting the most out of this is that really that nobody's above reproach. And the second thing is I'm really getting insights into the political dynamics of the time and just how corrupt these, these actions were. There is like a ton more that you can go into is the idea of usury and how that's viewed and, and, and the way uh, even uh, I, I thought it was the importance of fraud and friendships and the dynamics of it. If you're you know, fraudulent to a friend, it's much more severe than if you're fraudulent to somebody else uh, because you have a contract with that person. So it's a real betrayal and what betrayal really looks like. Um, so I, I, I think that the, all these are really interesting things to me. But what it does is it ultimately gives you a framework also for understanding ethics in general. Um, it may not be, you may not subscribe to the hierarchical structure that he's laid out for us, but it, it's nonetheless, it's very interesting. So um, I'll just leave my comments there, but uh, I'm enjoying reading it, but I'd like to read it a little, I'd, I'd like to read it a few more times before I really start commenting on it. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Maxine, what are you, what are you getting from reading of Dante? Well, kind of a reaffirmation of my own views. Um, there were two parts that stood out for me. Uh, the first are um, the souls, which we just talked about, how they can't look back. They always have to look forward. I like that. And, um, and their punishment is 
looking back. <laughs> and um, I believe that's the way we should live our lives. We can't look back. We have to just constantly go forward. Um, also, I enjoyed the part about the tailor. Um, the tailor made his suit and he knew exactly how to make it. And that was wonderful because he could uh, see what Dante was like, but then all of a sudden his relationship changed and, and Dante didn't pick up on that. And that's important to recognize relationships changing. And uh, then you have to re reevaluate your views. Uh, you can't always um, you can't always well. That's looking backwards on the views of people that you meet um, and people that you have relationships with. You have to adjust your views to the way things are and not the way things were. And he has a lot of, there are so many things in, you could, you could do one night on each canto. Um, you do, there's just so much in, in all of them to, um, to look into. It's just amazing. And I'm sure that I'll just keep going with this, even when we leave the, leave maybe the part that we're going through tonight, I'll just keep reading it before I read the next part. Wonderful, thank you, thank you, Maxine. I, I like, uh, for example, Rosella was saying, you know, I have read it 300 times and still every time I read it, I will get something new. I mean, that's, that's the standard of great art because what he's doing is that he's actually taking the entire worldview at that time, all of philosophy, all of understanding of social dynamics, all of religion, he's putting it all together and he's actually making it concrete for you. So it is something very special. Thank you, thank you, Maxine. Uh, next up is going to be Vanessa uh, and Jason. Vanessa. Okay, to be honest, I'm struggling this, but for a different reason, uh, because I don't know the history being referred to. I, I set out read, hoping to read them all and I got through 17 and kind of had to skim a few because it got to the point, okay, if I try to think through who these people are, I may be lucky to get through five cantos. And also there's um, maybe midway through, there's a mixture of history and also mythology. They're talking about minotaurs, centaurs, Epicarius, uh, and even Mars is brought up there. As far as I know, Mars is the Roman god and also the planet. So it's like, okay, you know, then trying to figure out, okay, are we talking mythology or actually history here? But there's also the, um, there's kind of this Old Testament vibe to it, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The punishment fits the crime. And kind of sorry to bring this up, I think, but this is a cultural thing. I think of the Godfather movies. Just think of, you know, the horse. I won't say more about that if someone hasn't seen it, but you think, okay, that's like the absolute revenge or if you talk about justice, you know, if you're thinking, okay, I want to find justice, this is how I find it. Um, but it's funny as, um, let's see, I think it was maybe in Canto's, uh, 14 when he's they're talking about going um down you know to the layers of hell and it's implied that they're actually going to the center of the universe like so i was like wait a minute the center of the universe is actually you know when you reach it you're actually at the uh, lowest layer of hell but then if you think okay heaven's talking about from being up above so maybe that kind of makes sense and there was another point where this kind of like the hidden message i got the impression that the one uh character they were interacting with almost like maybe Jesus in disguise. You know, I'm going to kindly give you the words and like teach you the way. Not so much. I don't want to, you know, slap it in your face, but, you know, kind of build it more in a nice way. And also maybe a few layers down, there's, you're left with the thing, um, whether it's just Virgil trying, to, um, not sorry, Dante trying to be, you know, a good Christian is saying, I will pray for you. And I will ask if you can be removed maybe not to heaven, but at least get a lesser punishment. And in one case, I think they were people from the same uh, either town he was living at or his birthplace. 
Um, and he was like surprised to see them down there. And there's also like what, like Joe briefly brought up ethics. I think the one we're talking about separating the one into two is like, well, put your ethics aside, you know, or like logic or common sense. And if you kind of put that aside, that maybe you understand why this punishment was put forth. Like I said, it's, you know, it's one of those, if you're just reading it as a story, so I think next time maybe that there's a website that lists all the characters and you kind of have a cliff notes you can easily refer to rather than thinking, okay, I'm getting more lost than when I began. So that's it for now. Thank you, uh, Vanessa. And uh, Phil, if you have any uh, resources or something that, uh, if you have any ideas, you can go ahead and put it in chat um, so people can uh, use. Otherwise, uh, Vanessa, what we'll do is that if there is anything that we can think of after the meetup, we'll go ahead and send it to you, okay? Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Jason, Doug, Madeline and Christian. Jason. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, this is my, this sector from 12 to 20, uh, 12 to 22 is my third time read it. Okay. And uh, uh, I'm so happy. I uh, uh, experience is at the read the third time. Uh, I, something doesn't make sense before start to make sense now. And I believe, you know, in the future will be more make more sense and i think the idea we should read one candle per week and then make it a two-year project and that probably would be interesting and the one thing i start to understand i like to share uh, i hope i'm correct uh, is i always wonder why from circle one to six like each circle is just one scene and the seven a and the nine like a seven have like three different division and the uh, circle eight have the 10 different digits and the circle nine have uh, four and the, each one have a more. So I look at it and I start to understand that because it's like a cone, right? So first level is wider. The second one going down is smaller. To the seven, eight and nine is smaller. The, the circle is smaller. So you need the deeper so you can hold more thinner. That's why you need the more devil. So uh, that's, I think, at least that's my, I, I understand, you know, the whole structure, probably because of my engineering background. So I'm more interested on the, how the hard way of, you know, make it. So that's the thing I find out quite interesting. And I also try to understand how Dante organized the scenes, the severe, so I find, just uh, this week, I read the uh, Greek play, uh, Medea, talk about Jason, not me, and another Jason, Jason the Golden Fleet. So I realized uh, Jason has been put in, the, I think the circle eight as a seducer, okay? Not because he, I always think he should commit like adultery because he married another woman. So uh, dump his own wife. So, but actually it's not. So he's not considered as last, okay? Last is much lighter scene because you just cannot control your desire. But Jason, the golden fleet Jason is being considered as hyper rational. So everything is in his mind. He is planning to dump his material uh, wife and marry the princess. Everything is in his plan. The rationality of Jason make him uh, not just dust, basics is a uh, seducer. So it's a much severe sin, okay? And also interest like uh, some philosophy like uh, Seneca, right? He's in the virtuous, virtuous pagan, but he's a stoic uh, a philosopher. But for the upside, Epicurean, it's not that easy. It's not, uh, 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 a virtuous uh, pagan. It's a serious crime, so become a heretics, right? So, and another thing is like, uh, I find out the bias of Dante, he probably like, pref just like last time we talked about, I think uh, he preferred Roman than Greek. So Caesar is a, a virtuous pagan, but Alexander the Great, is different, he is a tyranny. So that's the different way. So I find out that this thing is interesting, but 
Something I still need to figure out is some scene is more severe, for example, than the other. For example, the simonist and uh, hypocrisy, and uh, they are different. And uh, they look like the simonist is not that severe than hypocrisy. So uh, another thing like this detail, I think I need some time to figure out or somebody have answered, that'd be great. Oh, thank you, that's it. Thank you, thank you, Jason. Um, I mean, uh, this is this is amazing because this is what kind of great artists does. They take everything, they take everything before them. You know, mythology, religion, uh, politics, and everything. It's, and he, but the beautiful thing is that he has a hierarchy, and he arranges all of these things: mythological things, actual historical things, current politics, all of it you know, popes, everything in, in the hierarchy. So it's, it's amazing. And the thing is that you do need the context because, you know, he wrote it for his time and many learned people at that time would be familiar with all of this. So all of these things would be uh, that they would immediately know what these issues were and what he was saying about these various people. And not, he was not just talking about people he's talking about, he's making philosophical points about what is more virtuous, what is more, um, you know, more evil, uh, you know, in, in this hierarchy using all these uh, rich examples. But uh, great, great points, uh, Jason. Uh, thank you. So next up is going to be Doug, Madeline, and Christian. So Doug, floor is yours. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to talk as much as I've talked to uh, other uh, at other time. Um, Doug, we're having problems. In a way, the more audio. I read this, yeah, I'm gonna have to freeze my picture. Hold on. Sure. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to stop my video for it. Sure. Work, I think. I, sure. I'm hardwired. I don't know why it's not working, but. Uh, sure. um, but there are legends, there are fables, there are different things, and then there are commentaries on them. And this has fascinated me for decades. And I, going back to the earliest in kind of our Western tradition, there are the Aesop's fables and they tell a certain story and then there's a moral. And then the more I studied the fables, the less the morals seemed to really apply to the fable. It's like it was some explanation that came later to tame the fable you know, to make it uh, so that nobody would misunderstand or do anything wrong by reading the story. And stories are often based on imagery. And so I think this is the key to me in trying to read Dante and some people, have, because I think the you, you need some of the imagery of the history and all, well, sometimes you need a lot of it, uh, but that does slow you down in the reading of it. So to me, I'm trying to read this the way as if there were no commentary. It's the way actors read a script. Sometimes they ignore the stage direction. They ignore the stuff. They just go to the language and what does it say? And, and what's the life of the play in the language as the surface of something subterranean going on? And so I think the way to read this sometimes is uh, to go to the imagery, like in dream work. Some dream work, the point is to analyze it and come up with a conclusion. But a lot of dream work is to just sit with the image and let the image sort of dominate what you, uh, what you feel and then associate with. And I think that's really, I think that's the level where I realize he really is a poet. He's not, <laughs> and he is a writer of a great encyclopedia, but he's a poet and the imagery is astonishing. Uh, when you really sit with it and it starts to lead you into your own personal connections with it, which is why uh, I'm going to encourage that kind of reading. For example, I have two editions, one by an Irish translator and one by C.H. Uh, Sasan. Neither one of them have canto headings. In the footnotes, they refer to things and they have titles. And then I was talking to C.J. about this and uh, and it seems like the original text didn't have divine comedy and it probably didn't have most of these titles and it didn't have commentary that all came later. You sort of, a, you were reading it as a book. And so I've been trying to do that. Of course, you know, you need to know the meaning of some of the people you need to know who Jason was and the significance of the betrayal 
the Medusa that leads to her slaughtering her own children, not because she hates her children, but because she hates Jason, he's going to destroy the future for Jason. She's going to destroy his future. And she's protected by the gods in doing that. Uh, and so if you don't know the history, it's important, but I, I can also like never get to the end of uh, one of the books, <laughs> you know, if I spend all my time researching the history. So it's a weird kind of balance. So some of, it's a difference between Freudian analysis, which in the way it's practiced is what's the analysis, what's the conclusion, whereas Jungian analysis or some other analysts or Otto Ronk or other people read it more like literature and you need to soak yourself in the imagery because the imagery comes before words and movement comes before words. So I try to think of how would I stage this? How would I speak it? I speak it out loud sometimes. And this time I was busy on a project. So I was not able to read the sections 12 to 22, which I think we're covering uh, more than one and a half times. And usually I try to read it two or three times and I haven't been able to do that. But some of the imagery that sticks to me is of course, Gary on circling down in a spiral. And then the Malabosias, which are Malabosia, I guess, the, which are almost like a roller coaster of drops. And there are three things that really struck me. He does nothing to describe the sin of sodomy. In fact, the most intimate space he wants to have with the sinners is in the section on sodomy. He wants to sit down with uh, Brunetto. He wants to jump down and mingle with the three guys circling in a circle. So, he, and, and it doesn't seem, and it, it seems like Virgil actually encourages that. So there's not this horror to that sin. Uh, and the fact that murder and sodomy, and if it is sodomy that he's getting at, or a different kind of cabal or a different kind of self-dealing, or, or to me, sometimes it feels like scholars who create a simulation of nature without really dealing with nature or the primary reality, you know? So I think there are a number of possibilities uh, in terms of what that section on sodomy means. The interesting thing to me is that murder is higher up in hell than the misuse of words. And that whole roller coaster through seducers, through grafters, through simony, it's a using of words to convince people, you give me money and I'll get you into heaven. It's a misuse of uh, the truth in every case. So the misuse of words is the great sin because it tears apart city states and cultures and societies. And so that's the thing that really strikes me is you get further down into hell, the great sins are the liars and seducers and grafters, which is why the popes get such a beating. You know, they're anything but spiritual. They have their armies and they're using force. They're not using love. Uh, they're using muscle. And as Bucky would say, muscle is nothing, mind is everything. But Dante is saying the same thing. So I, I think I'm gonna leave it there and say, uh, you know, what is, what is the real Dante and what are the layers of explanation to try to tame Dante? And I think once you get to the imagery, it starts to spill out and really, and really digest the imagery at a gut level, like, as if it was a dream and you wake up going, what was that about? And you explain it away, yeah, but the power of the dream might be in just sitting with the energy of it. And that's what I'm trying to do with this reading. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. I, th I think that's a great point. I mean, what every great poet, I mean, earlier I was making the point that the, the, a great poet takes in everything before him. But the point that you're making is as profound that in the language itself, a great poet speaks to anybody. The, the language itself carries those images themselves carry the universal patterns that will echo with you. Um, knowing all the context will help, but in addition to that, there is the language itself. There are the images themselves, which is actually carrying a lot of power. So I, you know, thank you. Thank you for just, you know, pinpointing that. And I, I always like your approach of reading it as a story and saying, okay, how would this be performed? How would I speak it out? 
you know, as, as a human being living through this thing. So it, it's just wonderful, wonderful points. Thank you. Uh, well, next time, let me add please. one quick thing. The music of the language and the lines, that's one thing, which if you don't read Italian, you get a shadow of it or you get some simulation of it. But the other is the music of the movement, that roller coaster ride. There's a music to that up, down, up, looking down and one time they actually travel down and then back up and then down again and up it's a there's a music to that too um, uh, one uh, one term that leonardo had uh is excellences upon excellences so great works of art have that now there are just so many kinds of excellences all packed in that you can actually zoom in on any of them and all of them actually speak to you uh, and it pro pro provides this kind of rich chorus at so many different levels, at the conceptual level, at the visual level, at the, at the sound level. Uh, so, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, next up is Madeline, Christian, and Mike. Madeline. Yes. Uh, thank you, Shrikant. Um, I, too, was very struck by the imagery, and it really affects how I read it. Um, I noticed in the uh, Canto 15, the Sodomite section, there's a marvelous part. Uh, we encountered a band of souls coming along the barrier, and each was gazing at us as in the evening. People gaze at one another under the new moon, and they sharpened their brows towards us as the old tailor does at the eye of his needle. And uh, I thought, you know, that's... As the old tailor does through the eye of his needle, I think Dante chooses his images with care. Uh, since the in the sodomite section, the tailor is about to put the thread into the hole. Um, I also loved the um, the part in Canto Thirteen. Um, he's plucked a small branch from a thorn bush. As when a green log is burnt at one end, from the other it drips and sputters as air escapes. So from the broken stump came forth words and blood together, and I let the tip fall and stood like one afraid. It was just, it was so striking and brilliant and um, came words and blood together. In the main thing I was struck by in this, <clears throat> in this group of um, cantos that we read for this month was the introduction of both the centaurs and the minotaur. Um, because since this is um, in the section about violence, um, where Virgil is standing at the breast of the centaur where the, where the two natures are wedded. And so um, it seemed as if this, the imagery here was really talking about um, in people, the, the rational moral function is uh, wedded to the uh, sort of amoral animal functions. And we are struggling along like centaurs and minotaurs. Um, and I thought that the introduction of that imagery in the violent section was, was just, it was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Appreciate that. Next up is going to be Christian, Mike Sorn, and Shirley. Christian. Uh, I've kind of been struggling reading this because this is my first time reading it. So uh, I've been learning a lot, especially listening to the discussions, because uh, I've been following along online on the YouTube uh, channel, and I watched the video, and I've also been reading online and uh, going through the analysis and questions that uh, CJ has gave us. Um, so I'm missing some of the context in terms of uh, Florentine's politics and history. So I'm kind of reading it like a piece of literature. I think Doug brought this up earlier, um, but I do get the context in terms of Greek mythology because I, I always enjoyed that. I guess I'm uh, a little confused of why he would use Greek mythology with the storytelling because I know that, you know, he is a Catholic and 
um, you know, I would think that the people who are, uh, I guess, like the people who would believe in Greek mythology, wouldn't they be more so pagans? So that was a question that went through my mind. Um, but yeah, I've been really enjoying this. And uh, that was something that really struck me was the use of the language and imagery with his work and also his vast amount of knowledge of so many different topics because I um, I don't know I feel like the more that I'm reading the more I feel like wow I really don't know a lot so yeah but that's all I um, got from my reading. Uh, thank you thank you Christian. Christian we're going to have a Q&A section after the breakout rooms so please raise this question about mythology I think it's an important question. Uh, and we'll see what, what people have to say uh, over there. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Uh, next right. up is going to be Mike, followed by Shirley. Mike, go ahead. Um, hi. Um, I've, always, I've struggled a little bit with, uh, well, not a little bit, a lot with uh, the biblical basis for some of the things that he said. And um, uh, for a large part, it isn't there. There aren't that many descriptions of what heaven and hell are all about uh, in uh, uh, in the Bible, and um, and and uh, in some of the apocryphal works, uh, it is covered. And some of what he says con contradicts. I know you, uh, uh, the young lady who spoke. Uh, um, said that uh, that uh, Dante was the first place they talked about Lake of Fire. Uh, in Matthew, uh, they talk about uh, the fact that, that you get to sit at the table with the kingdom of God when he returns, uh, and then you'll be raised from the grave. It doesn't talk about the elaborate levels of punishment. Uh, now, the... Uh, the Quran has um, has uh, discusses the crucifixion and Jesus and uh, and heaven and hell in great detail, but it doesn't talk about these kinds of things either. Uh, much of what he says come it sounds like it comes from the Haditha, which is a um, not a I wouldn't say an apocryphal work, but a, a kind of a commentary, uh, an inspired commentary in Islam. I wonder uh, if uh, other people have noticed the uh, contradictions and uh, uh, and whatever support I I, I kind of got that stuff from the, uh, from Doug Jacobs' uh, comments, uh, but uh, I I, uh, I for years I've puzzled with um, with what he's described. Uh, and I guess there's something, there's some similar, you can make a similar analysis with Emanuel Swedenborg's definitions, which uh, is not the subject of discussion, and John Melton's definitions of these things. Uh, and a lot of it is poetic license, but a lot of it seems to be accepted and uh, without, by people who haven't really read Dante's Inferno, evang evangelical Christians, have uh, incorporated uh, Dante's Inferno by inclusion in their philosophy. I wonder if some of the assembled experts can make some comments about that as to the biblical authority or uh, why it's been accepted and whether it should be accepted or whether it's just art. And thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, please bring up this question again in the Q&A section. What we're doing right now is we're just uh, getting people's, you know, we're asking people, what are they getting from the reading? Uh, so uh, people are talk putting their takeaways as well as questions. We'll have an entire Q&A period uh, after the breakout rooms. Uh, so we'll uh, please bring it, bring it up there. Uh, next up is going to be Shirley. Shirley, what, what do you think? Uh, Shirley, you need to unmute yourself, though. I'm not going to hell, and I'm going to work very hard not to get there. So I got that out of there. <laughs> uh, second, I was, what I also got out of it was how contemporary it is with what's going on today. Now, one of the other things that came to me, third, would be in Canto 12, when he speaks about the Minotaur. And I don't know if people know how 
how the Minotaur came about. But um, the king of Crete, his wife had sex with a white bull, and that's what produced the Minotaur. Uh, Donnie doesn't talk too much about it. It's mm-hmm. just kind of stuck in there. But there is a painting around there, a painting by a fellow by the name of uh, Vanderlyn, and it's called uh, Aranani on the Isle of Nexus. And she's uh, laying on the grass. And in the back, uh, you see um, Thesis sneaking off because she's also pregnant But in this picture. But all's not lost because the Bacchus comes down and marries her and they live happily ever after. So that kind of reminded me of the painting, which was beautiful work. Another thing that came to me that I was interested in was in uh, Canto 15 when we spoke of sodomy because he also spoke of homosexuality and heterosexuality. And he seems in lust. And he, he feels that the lust itself is the same for homosexuality as it is for homo- heterosexuality. He doesn't seem to separate that. It's okay. And of course, we know in the Middle Ages, it was men and boys. And it was a sin, but it wasn't unheard of. So uh, I thought that was um, interesting about that. Uh, but Dante seems to have, um, with the sodomites, he goes a little deeper. He, yeah, because um, if you think of the rain coming down, I, I think this is a powerful thing. I can't find it. But it was powerful, the rain coming down. And if you think about it, the rain would symbolize life. But it's not. It's scorching rain. So it's sand, it's, it's, it's sterility, it's unproductive, um, which would make it a sin because the rain should be life, given the soil and making the soil fertile. It's symbolically, I think um, the sex pra- practice of uh, the sodomites are, are not life-giving. And that's why he puts them very low. Actually, he puts them below the homosexual and heterosexual folks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Shirley. Uh, folks, uh, we're going to go. Uh, so does anybody else want to share what they're getting from uh, Dante? You can go ahead and type exclamation mark. Otherwise, we're going to go to Phil's presentation. David, what about you? Do you want to share? No? No, I'm, I'm finding it uh, fairly complex, and I like what people have been saying, so... Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, Phil, floor is yours. Okay. Uh, before I go into, uh, uh, in, into the details, I, I just want to point out the amazing timing uh, that we have for this, for this meetup. So if you have, if you have the book, uh, if you open it to Canto 21 and verse uh, 112, and there you will see that they're, they're talking about um, that five hours from the time they're talking about, it will be 12, uh, 1,266 years since the shattering of this rock. And of course, that symbolizes the descent of Christ into hell and then his ascension in resurrection. And of course, today is Easter Sunday. So we are literally in the same <laughs> spot as they were in terms of the chronology. So we are uh, following Dante and Virgil, literally, you know, in the same vein, uh, in the same chronology, we caught up with them. They're, they're on the Easter, they're about to get into the Easter Sunday as they emerge from the other side, the, the Purgatory Mount, and we are right there with them. So uh, I just want to point that out, how uh, fortuitous it is. <laughs> Um, that that we are at this point. So anyway, um, I wanted to do a couple of things. Uh, I you know there were a couple of people that mentioned they were struggling with um, reading, and I want to do something for for people that are possibly overwhelmed by the amount of detail that um, that you know you see in Dante's work. And it, you know it isn't. We've mentioned several times. It's so encyclopedic. It assumes that you know a lot about history, contemporary history of when Dante wrote it, also mythology, politics, 
philosophy, theology. There's just so many different subjects that this touches on. So, and also there's a lot of detail in each canto, the people you meet, the punishments. It's very easy, I think, to get vertigo as you <laughs> as you are on the on the back of Gary and descending from uh, from one uh, place to the to the next. So what I wanted to do is. Uh, uh, show you one of these maps. And I think most books have a, a, some sort of map of, of, of Inferno, uh, but I want to make sure that if you if your edition doesn't have it, that you get the benefit of it. So let me let me try to share my screen here real quick. Um, actually, I guess, let me see. Uh, okay. okay, can you see this? Yep. Okay, so this is this is actually taken from uh, the Apostolic Library of Vatican. They have a really nice image of this. Unfortunately, uh, you, you can you can actually zoom in there if you find it. Just Google um, Biblioteca Apostolica Vaticana, and then you can just type in Dante, and you will find this image. Uh, and there you can zoom in. But what I want to do is just very quickly um, let me put this here so I'm looking straight at you. Uh, show you a couple of things that might might help you to sort of get your get your bearings because we're moving fast and it's like i said it's very easy to get in uh to get lost in in, in the details of of all this um material so just to recap um i put the you know i, I made i made these annotations here to this image so you can see the different um structures and rivers in hell and and these serve as divisions as important divisions that we encounter. So the very first structure that we have right after we get out from the dark wood is the gates of hell. And there you have this crowd of people, if you remember, that are rejected. They're not in heaven, not in hell, not anywhere. And then very quickly we go. Just, we, just a second, um, Phil, we're just seeing a list, um, just a result of files. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't see any images. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I guess I'm sharing the wrong thing, one second. Uh, now I see the map. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Uh, okay, <laughs> okay, good. All right, let, let me let me see if I can. Do you guys still see it? Uh, it's coming up. Give me just a second. It's all dark. Give me a second. Nope, we can't see it. Oh, there oh, it is. Yeah, I, we there. see it now. Now, now it's good. Okay, but let me uh, one second. Though. Let me. Uh, I think I'm I'm sharing. Uh, do you see my annotations there or, or just the image? Uh, just the image, but just before this, we saw your an annotations. Okay, so let me close this out. This actually is not, not what I wanted to. Let me. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, no problem. Okay, how about now? Yes. Now okay. we see both the image and the annotations. Right, right. So that's what I wanted to just very quickly, I'm not going to spend much time on here, but I want to make sure that people that are new to this at least get, get, a, get a sense of what's happening and where, where we're going and, and where we've been. So, uh, so as I was saying, these structures, I have them in little boxes. So we have Gates of Hell, we have City of Dis, and then we have the Malibulge. Those are the three main structures that we actually encounter. And then you have the rivers. And the rivers serve both the rivers and the structures. They serve as sort of these divisions in the text. They're, they're, they're another device that Dante uses to sort of create these little barriers and indicate that we are encountering a new area. So, the, of course, we're in the city of Dis right now, and uh, I don't know if you can see in this image right here where my pointer is. That's the wall of the city of Dis. That's the lower hell right here. And then as we go down and we make the flight with Garion, here's little Garion, you probably can't see him, but there he is. And we make the flight to Malibulge. And this is where we're, we've been for the last um, week or so in the 10 pouches of Malibulge right here. We're very close actually to, to well, yeah, like we're probably halfway through Malibulge, which is this area that has these different sort of, uh, ditches or pouches, Malibos literally means bad, bad pouch, evil pouch. <laughs> and so, uh, and then we're going down to the last circle. So, um, but what's the, you know, besides the fact that this is so detailed and uh, intricate and 
very precise, uh, precisely architected. Dante, of course, has the uh, has the um, moral and ethical component to this map, and and that moral and ethical component is described to us in Canto Eleven. So Roselle actually went through Canto Ten with the mm -hmm. heretics, but Canto Eleven serves as this watershed moment, and we touched on it a little bit, where Dante and Virgil have this extended conversation about the, the mapping of, of hell. And if you get lost and if somehow like you're like you're not sure like why you know why we're here or what's 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 going on, go back to Canto 11 and reread re it because it actually gives a very good uh, look back and look forward. And and what you get out of it if you read it is that um, the ethical mapping of hell has to do with the three different dispositions that sinful dispositions that, that, that people can have and the corresponding punishments to those dispositions. And so the first one, the first disposition is this incontinence. And that's what you can see on uh, uh, the first three circles that we had with the lustful, the gluttonous, the avaricious. Those are the three circles of the incontinence. And they're the least uh, uh, offensive to God. And then you have, notice you have the river sticks which again, the rivers serve as, the, uh, as an indication that something is changing now. And now you have this different, uh, different area, and that's the area of what Dante calls um, uh, mad bestiality. And the bestiality can be physical, as the sodomites and the, 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 the violent, or it could be um, spiritual, as the, as the, uh, the heretics and the, the, the usurers, so it's a, it's a sort of different kind of bestiality. And then the, the last part, which is basically half of Inferno is fraud. And, that, and that's something that of course is, we, we should probably appreciate the fact that Dante pays so much attention to fraud and devotes really half of the, half of Inferno to, to that subject. Um, but that's, that's where we are right now. We're in the last part of this, which is, which is what he calls malice. So malice and fraud, and, and, there, and there are different kinds of malice. So there's regular fraud, and then there's what he calls treacherous fraud. And treacherous fraud is when you defraud somebody you have actually a personal connection to. And that's, that's the, ultimate, the ultimate sin. But in, going back to Canto 11, where all of this geography is described and mapped out, he talks about um, fr um, the proper occupation of man, which is using his talents and his nature to earn a living versus the unnatural. And, and of course, that is what he describes as fraud, is when you use unnatural means, whether it's usury, which in his view is wrong, or uh, some other way of de deception. And, and there is the famous line, and uh, I, I would be curious uh, if Doug has anything to say about it, about art being God's grandchild. And the fact that we use art as something that is God given to us, uh, we are, are ourselves an artifact of God. And then what, whatever our artifacts are, they are the grandchildren of God, right? Because you know, we're creation and then we make our own creations, whether it's craft or art or anything else. And of course, Dante himself is a poet. Uh, so this is a very interesting expression of art being God's grandchild. So that's, uh, I don't know if this was helpful, I, I hope, I hope this was helpful, just this map and um, orienting ourselves where we're we going. So again, we're, we're right here in these little pouches of Malibold right now. And we're just going, again, it's hard to see. And let me see if I can zoom in just a little bit. It's, yeah, it's still very hard to see, but you can see these little bridges that we're crossing from one ditch to the next. And in each ditch, there, is, there are different, different uh, types of fraud. That are described, and so we had the the, the, the simonists and the barriers and the flatterers, different 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 kinds of things going on. Okay, uh, let me stop sharing. Okay, um, so that that was that was just one one thing I wanted to. Uh, oh, Phil, let me just comment on this. I, I think this is fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think what we will do is that in the Q and A period, we'll bring this image up and look at you know any questions that people have Se several people have made several comments about this map shirley says she doesn't need the map she doesn't plan on going there 
uh, you know, Jason is, uh, you know, is, is saying that, okay, it's a funnel. So more people are at the top and less people are there. Doug has talked about the fact that use of words, misuse of words is such a heinous thing right. as compared to everything right. else. So, so there are lots of people who have lots of thoughts about, about the Okay, map. well, I'm glad at least we got some kind of response. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. wonderful. Yeah. That was okay. wonderful. Um, yeah, that was good. Excellent. I so, wanted to mention just one, one, one other thought, um, if I may. No, so, please, please take your time. I just wanted to make the oh, comment okay. so okay. people have a continuity between now and uh, the, the question, uh, Q&A period. So they can continue okay. to think about okay. any questions um, that they have with respect to the map. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, one other thing I wanted to, to mention, um, again, <clears throat> I know some, some people are very knowledgeable about the subject here. We have lots of people very into Dante and the history and everything. But then there are people that are completely, sounds like uh, this is the first time they're encountering this or the context is very new. And again, I just want to mention something that hopefully maybe will provoke some, some thought or research on your part, um, which and, and it is this, it's this idea of medieval mindset as a whole and how it's different from our mindset. And I think we have to really appreciate that to get a good feel for Dante because it's not, you know, Dante didn't think like we do today. And people in general back then didn't think and vice versa, we, we don't think like they did either. We have a very different view of the world than what they had. And, and one way that expresses itself is this idea that everything in Dante's mind, everything that this world is, has been architected by God. It's like central planning. I mean, it's the classical central planning. Like if you know, some cities have been planned, they have a center and everything kind of radiates out. And there, there's no, no, it's very deterministic. And in, in medieval mind, that's how everything was, uh, supposedly, because God made it, right? So everything is predetermined. Everything makes sense. Everything has significance. And everything is connected to everything else because it's how it's designed. And because of that, there is this obsession with things like numbers, for instance. Like, where is it coming from? Well, the reason is because if God created it, then it, if he created seven of you know, seven sins, and then, well, he didn't create seven sins, but if there's such a thing as seven sins, then numbers seven is significant, then there's other things that are significant that has to do with number seven. In our case, you know, we, we know that Dante is obsessed with number nine. We already saw it in La Vita Nova. He was nine when he met Beatrice. He was nine years again, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In, the, in Inferno, of course, we have nine circles of hell. And again, we, we have this uh, idea of numbers being very significant. And it wasn't just a, a literary thing. It was actually people believed it, that everything has this significance in terms of numbers. You know, stars, constellations are not random. It's how they are. Uh, animals, you know, animals are not just animals. They also have some sort of representation. They have a hidden meaning, which is why we see like leopards and all, you know, all these animals that Dante meets in, in the opening of Inferno. Uh, so you have numbers, you have stars, and astrology, of course, is right there with, with that whole idea that stars have some effect on people is also part of this idea that God created stars. And therefore, when you're born, whatever zodiac sign you're born under that has to have some significance in your life it was, it was just a given and with that mindset uh i think it has a lot to do with how dante architects hell it has very particular structure and everything has meaning how high up you are which ditch you're in uh you know the contrapasso you know rosella mentioned this idea of contrapasso which is this idea that crime fits the pun uh, punishment fits the crime rather, or it has some significance. So everything is significant like that. And I think when you read it with, with that mindset, with that medieval mindset that, you know, there, 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 there are no, um, there's no, there's nothing random. Nothing is sort of like, like we would say today, organic, you know, <laughs> nothing grows organically. It's all planned. It's all pre-planned either, you know, uh, and therefore, when you when you read it like that, I think it gives you a little more appreciation. Um, think of medieval paintings also. Uh, everything in a medieval painting has some meaning. There's nothing just, you know, uh, a bird is not just a bird. 
you know, an owl is not just an owl. It's actually, a, you know, probably a symbol of something, etc. So uh, with that mindset, I think it's, it's, it's helpful to look at the architecture and the map of hell as also having very important um, meaning and, and weight to it. Uh, and the one last point I just want to make, and, that, and that's it, um, is, is uh, Dante in, in the work, it's in, uh, Dante himself in the work. And I think Rosella also mentioned uh, this interweaving of Dante, the protagonist, and Dante, the narrator. And um, that is very evident in, um, in some of the contests we've read. For instance, um, if you want to turn with me just real quickly, to Canto 20 and verse 19, uh, if you have it open, I'll read it for you. Uh, so in my version, it says, may God so let you read or gather fruit from what you read. So this is not Dante, the protagonist. This is Dante, the narrator who steps out from the, from the story essentially and starts speaking to you, to you, the reader directly. So this is a different Dante than the one that says, you know, we descended on the back of Gary and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is a basically just a regular first person narrative, which was very common, by the way, in, in classical literature and, and the literature of that time. We just narrate from, from the first person. Uh, but this one is a little different where the author now steps out and says, oh, reader. So now he's talking to you, the reader, you know, he's not a protagonist anymore. Then of course you have Dante, the historical person who is figuring everywhere and again i just want to go tie it back to what rosella was talking about with the different parties so all of that is historical that historical in that historical context dante is not the protagonist he's not the narrator he's the historical dante that lived in that time that's the third dante that that figures in the in, in the book and the fourth one is the one that actually created everything right he's the creator of this of this work so he's the actual author proper and now we have to address all four of these different Dantes as they show up in, in the work. <laughs> I want to just point that out. So as you read it, you might appreciate the kind of the, that interweaving of the different Dantes that you see in, 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 in the work. Well, can, you, that, can you list the four Dantes again? Yes. Yeah. So the first one is the protagonist, Dante, the protagonist, the actor, the one who goes down to hell with Virgil, etc. The second one is Dante the narrator, when he steps out of his protagonist role and starts narrating and addressing the reader and saying, hey, pay attention, by the way, or et cetera. I mean, we've seen several times when he does this, uh, and this will continue happening, by the way, in, in Purgatory and, and so forth. Uh, then you have Dante, the uh, historical person, mm -hmm. right? Dante, who is involved in these political parties. And, you know, when, when uh, Ferdinanda makes predictions about Dante's future, that's predictions about Dante, the historical person, not Dante who is particular, you know, participating in the hell. And then the last one is Dante, the, the, the poet, the creator of this poem, the one who laid out the cantos, the one who laid out everything else, the rhymes, etc. So that's the fourth one, uh, the one that we don't see, but that's implied, of course, in, in, in the reading, uh, Dante, the, the creator. So that's at least four. Now, there may be more than, than that. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Phil, this was brilliant. It was just full of, full of great points. I love, uh, and what we'll do is that uh, I'm listing these things as questions because I would like to see what people have to say, like uh, art as God's grandchild. What is the medieval mindset? What's this map? Um, then these four, four Dantes and uh, the uh, also Doug's point about reading it as a story mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, the, the place, low place held for people who abuse language. <laughs> right. So we'll, we'll talk about, uh, these are at least the questions that I have from then Christian had a point about mythology. Mike had a point about uh, Bible. So these are the questions that we will talk about when we come back, but folks, you will get a chance after the breakout rooms to put your own question down. So think of the questions. Uh, we're going to run the breakout rooms for 20 minutes. Uh, come back. You get to list all the questions that you have. Just one question per person, the best one that you have. And then we will do a rapid fire answering of all the questions. Okay. Uh, basically, everybody is going to answer the question. It's going to be a lightning round. All right. Starting the breakout rooms now.
Right. So maybe this question will be answered after we finish all three sections of the Divine Comedy. But uh, there's a constant tension for me for the protagonist to feel compassion for the suffering of the humanity that he beholds, some of whom are great people, some of whom are beloved teachers, you know, and, and this compassion is in conflict with the justice uh, and understanding the righteousness of this, the design of the universe. And I'd like to know how to reconcile those opposing tugs. I don't see them coming together. Excellent, uh, thank you. So compassion and justice. Okay, uh, next up is Beatrice. Beatrice is asking, why is tides shamed? Okay, tides shamed. Next up is Jason. Jason, what's your question? Well, my question is uh, uh, probably direct to Felix. Uh, he, Felix showed the river, uh, the, the river of the architecture, and where's the river this? Okay, I, I remember he mentioned it, and where's this? I, I just tried to find uh, it. What are the rivers in the architecture? The, the river we show like four rivers, right? So, okay. But I think they have another one, this, okay. L-E-T-H-E, right? And I, I remember in the text it mentioned, I just kind of cannot put in the whole sure. architecture. Sorry, my sure. question is very hard. That's fine. We, we were going to do a question and answers just on the map. So we'll put it there. Next up is Vanessa. Vanessa, what's your question? Okay, I got a boring science question. As you get lower down, is the same prevalent in those layers because it like absorbs the magnifying seat, like the reflection of the light can be hard to walk on. And then it's also brought up, it's like not supportive of any plant life down there. You know, in the desert we have cactuses, but down there it seemed to be, can't even hold, a, a seed can't even find its root. Okay, uh, got it. So what grows, uh, you know, in the depths of hell? Okay, depths of hell. Okay, all right, uh, who would like to go next? Uh, let's see, anybody else? Okay, I'm gonna put several questions that came up. Uh, so Phil or uh, Doug, would you like to put some questions on the table? Questions or answers? Uh, questions first. Oh, questions, okay. I think the one that Christiane uh, asked a couple of times is yes, why yes. are there so many mythological elements? Sure. So I'm going to add all the questions that I have before. Uh, Joe, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I, um, what was it? Um, I don't know if anybody understands why the, the suicides are grubbery shrub, like are shrubs. I don't know why he used okay. that imagery. Suicides as shrubs. Okay. Uh, so the questions I had from previous time was Mike asking about uh, the correspondence between the Bible and and Dante's work uh, to you know what what is the source of uh, you know source for Dante. Then we had the observation about art as God's grandchild, and I really want to know what people think of that. Um, then uh, the medieval mindset, how is medieval mindset different? Because that's something that we are going to actually face as we read Dante throughout. Uh, next one is uh, last we'll bring up the map and then uh, reading it as story, uh, you know, reading this work as story uh, as opposed to uh, a historical, you know, trying to get all the historical things, but just instead of that, reading it as a story using images. So those are the questions that I had. All right, so we'll, we'll just take it in order. Uh, I will raise the question. And then if you have an answer to it, just go ahead and type ex exclamation mark. Keep your answer short so we can get through as many questions with as many, for each of the questions, as many answers, and then as many questions as we possibly can. All right, so the first question is about compassion and justice. Where does compassion figure in this entire scheme? Uh, or is it just justice? Anybody? Uh, Joe? This could be completely wrong. Um, 
but I, I feel like again that he shows compassion uh, towards uh, Brunetto, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 in almost because he sees himself kind of taking that same track, and uh, he was a student, and I, the, even the idea that he was calling him a son, you know, that I think that there was a real uh, feeling of. You know, uh, he wanted to talk to him longer, but he had to go back to his group. Uh, so I think that there is an element of compassion that's being shown between Dante uh, at, at that point. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I could be I could be wrong on that, though. I mean, I, really, Philip should correct me. If I'm wrong. Excellent. Uh, next up. No, let, let everybody answer, because the thing is that what we're trying to do is that we're trying to have an interactive conversation. So everybody will answer, give their own answers because that's the way in which we are going to get deeper into this work. If every, all of us can try to answer as many questions as possible. So it's going to be Vanessa, Phil and Doug. Vanessa, what do you think? I definitely think compassion is a big part of that because in that one contos, when he comes across someone he knew, it's like you were taken too soon. Had you lived on the earth longer, you probably would be where I'm at or you wouldn't be doomed to hell. And if he even says, I will pray for you. And if my tongue will speak, I will also, you know, ask that you be forgiven. Thank you, uh, Phil. Um, I was trying to find the exact counter where, where this is mentioned. Um, so as, as, as we read through, there's definitely signs that Dante is very compassionate towards the sinners. I think it's unmistakable. It, almost from the start with um and now my uh, <laughs> uh you know in the in the lustful circle where he had that couple i mean it's obvious that dante is very much moved by their plight and then in every canto since he meets people that he feels identify with whether they are from because they're from the florence or just because of their plight however it's interesting that he uses this device, and I think it's used in literature quite a bit, where you have the, this sort of like apprentice and master relationship. And obviously Dante puts himself in this apprentice role. And the reason he does that is because he's using it to teach us, the readers, something that he wants us to learn. So at one point, he is actually rebuked by Virgil. And Virgil tells him, he says, hell is the place where pity is dead. I don't know if you remember that part, but it's a very striking passage. And that doesn't mean that Dante stops feeling compassion because he's not perfect. But Virgil's point is, if you believe that the punishment is just, then there is no room really for compassion because that means if you, if you feel compassion, that, then you feel something is not right here. And, and yet, I agree with people that are saying that there's this tension. I think there is the tension. And just because something is, quote, theologically correct, that doesn't mean that in literature, in poetry especially, you have this sort of cut and dry, um, you know, right and wrong type of answer. So I think the interplay of compassion, and, and, we'll, and it, it, it's not just an inferno. It actually goes past inferno and purgatory. There's a place where Dante meets somebody and he feels compassion and he wants to participate in a song with them. And he gets rebuked again. And, he, and he's told, no, you can't do this stuff. You're in heaven. Come on, you got to focus on, on important things. Here. Uh -huh. So there's this human side of him. There's, and then there's this sort of like the theological divine law. Uh -huh. And the two don't always meet. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Phil. Next up is Doug. Doug, what do you think? Uh, well, I think Dante feels compassion for some of the violence of the punishments, but Virgil often slaps him down for that. But the things he doesn't slap him down for is if love is some element in the sin, then there is compassion and Virgil seems to authorize that as okay, like his, his desire, you know, with Brunetto and uh, Francesca, and there's always Love seems to be, even when it gets people in trouble, to be the thing that arouses compassion in the storyline. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, okay, um, let's go to a couple of uh, very pointed questions. Uh, do you know why Thais was shamed? Does anybody want to answer that? 
uh, does anybody know what what the reference is? Well, I, I can I can sort of answer it. I do know the reference. So basically, there is. I think she is in the flatterer uh, circle, and uh, but the person that is mentioned that Tyus is not the historical Tyus. That's the uh, heroine of a play by um, I believe either Terence or State. I think it's Terence. Um, and in there, in that play, she plays. Uh, she she, uh, she plays a, per, a, a person who is asked a question by her lover, and she flatters. She doesn't say the you know she doesn't say the truth. So that's the that's the person that's condemned. So what's condemned there is a dishonest answer, and uh, and the reason she's answering like this, of course, is because she wants to secure the services of this person who is her lover. She wants him to keep essentially supporting her, etc. So the point there is. That's the reason you flatter because you're trying to get something from the person. You're not being truthful about the, you know, your actual feelings. Wonderful, thank you. Um, next question is Vanessa's question. Uh, Vanessa's, uh, I, I'm going to try to paraphrase it. Vanessa, correct me if I'm uh, getting this right. Uh, you're saying, um, what is the depths of hell like? Is there, there is no light there, nothing grows there. What what is the what is that like? What's no? Is, it was that, fair? Fact that that sand was emphasized. Sand was brought up so much, you know, and that not even up being able to walk on it. Like sand was came prevalent, just like you know, you had the the ashes, well, the the snowflakes of uh, fire fluttering around. Got it. So what's what's your question? Well, just why was that? Like, I mean, that was kind of the main thing being described, except for the the snowflakes, the fire, and other things mm -hmm. that was maybe more descriptive about the water, the trees, but they're just being, it was sand and fire basically, sure. and nothing growing, and even the sure. air was sucked out, it seems. Got it, so uh, so the question would be, what is what do you think of the description of the the lowest rungs of hell? Any, any comments, any thoughts? You can go ahead and type exclamation mark. David, David, go ahead. Unmute. Yeah, I'm, I'll tell you, Vanessa, I'm willing to grant all kinds of powers of civil engineering to the, the designer of this thing, because if there need to be trees that are going to die, and these trees are form, these shrubs are formerly people. So actually, whatever nutrients they're getting, this is some special kind of concoction. And there's obviously plenty of volcanic heat and energy. You know, there's plenty of energy, but as far as uh, it's structured for a reason and how it could be built is sort of a different, it's just like what will be amazing will be whatever comes next, whatever it is. So how could we anticipate with the right rules of, you know, physically what should be there? It, it has to be based on what it means, right? Thank you. Um, next up is going to be Christian. Christian, can you ask your question about mythology again? Um, yeah, so I was just curious because I know that um, I think one of the things that prompted me to ask this question was because one of the characters is in, I don't remember which part, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but one of the characters was in one part of the of hell and he um was there because something with zeus i don't remember exactly but i was wondering like why would they even bring that character up if we're more so thinking about christ and you know and dante's a catholic so Got it. why is there so much um i guess imagery and um bringing up of different creatures and myths from mm -hmm. Greek mythology. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, Phil, uh, so folks, uh, everybody can answer this question. So you can go, any question, anybody can answer. So just go ahead and type exclamation mark. Why is there so much, so many references to mythology in Dante's work? Uh, it's going to be Phil, Vanessa, and Doug, and Madeline. Phil. Right, so I we talked about this actually in our breakout rooms. Um, and this has to do with this, again, with this medieval mindset that tries to encompass everything. It's universalist, right? 
So you can't just deal with Christian parts of the world. You have to deal with all of the world. And so the task before Dante and then before really before Aquinas and some of the earlier church fathers was, what do we do with the classical heritage? Do we throw it overboard or do we incorporate it somehow into the Christian worldview? And they all essentially in the Roman Catholic, uh, at least tradition, decided that it, it needed to be incorporated. And the way they incorporated it is they said, this tradition actually prefigured the truth. So there is some truth to the idea there's, a, there's Zeus, the head god that rules over everything, and it really is a prefiguration of the real god. You know, not that Zeus was, you know, the Christian god, but it was a prefiguration, essentially. And therefore, Dante can then take that and run with it. So he can take all of these classical mythological figures, like Caponeus, for instance, who I think you're referring to, who is being arrogant towards Zeus and say, you know what, that's just arrogance against God, and therefore it's going to be punished. And we're going to use the story, which is familiar to a lot of people at that time, classical story, and it's much more powerful because you take things both from historical context, like he does, and from classical context. And it creates this uh, very diverse scenario where you, you are using examples from classical tradition, from Christian tradition, from historical tradition, and you're interweaving them into a single point that you're trying to make, which is either, you know, what, whether it's about blasphemers, I think that was the circle that we're dealing with, or something else, but that's, that's the idea. Or you can take somebody like Minotaur, who is a, you know, a creature that has no Christian counterpart at all, but he is a scary looking beast, so you can make him part of hell and make him, you know, uh, a warden in hell. <laughs> and so that's, I think that's the, uh, the answer that, I mean, part of it, I think is probably poetic as well. It makes for a much more entertaining story if, if you can incorporate all of these other traditions into your, your viewpoint. Thank you. Uh, Vanessa, why does Dante use mythological references? Well, I think at one point he does it directly when he's talking about the sellout, the one that said you either uh, chose to go with Mars versus the Christian God. And also sometimes he doesn't directly name it. I think the one thing Christian was referring to was the blacksmith. It's kind of implied about grabbing the lightning bolt. And one last thing about the Minotaur, as I'm reading that, it's almost implied it was a bastard child, you know, came unnaturally uh, in a cow's womb. You know, it's weird mm -hmm. you kind of read that maybe without giving all the background, like, oh, that's kind of weird if a kid was reading that. But, you know, it makes you think and ponder versus just seeing the black and white and it causes you to pause and maybe mull it over in your mind. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Vanessa. Next up is going to be Doug, Madeline, and Joe. Doug, why do you think? Uh, I think some of it is what Philip said, that the, the aspiration of the Catholic Church and the meaning of Catholic is inclusive, universal. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it embraces everything. And so there was a famous album in the 60s called Missa Luba, but it was a, a Catholic mass based on African music and, and using sort of local forms to express, uh, express the teachings. And so I, I think that that attempt to integrate pagan, Jewish, and even Maha, you know, Islamic teachings into the Catholic church is really coming to a head with Dante. And I just read something that uh, the dream of uh, Muhammad ascending to heaven may have influenced the story as well. And so if you can integrate, like Christmas wasn't a Christian holiday, but it was a popular pagan holiday, but the Catholic Church made it a Christian holiday to gather the energies into the, ca into the Catholic Church. And so it's that thing I mentioned in the first thing of, of churches being built on temple sites and uh, uh, and then being reused or later, you know, uh, different traditions take over a city and the holy sites they rebuild according to their teachings. But the Arabic libraries actually preserved more Western classical Greek and Roman writings than the West did. And they began to be re-imported during the Renaissance. So there was a big attempt in the early Renaissance through the whole Renaissance to even Christianize the Kabbalah and to, you know, and to take all these philosophical teachings and integrate them into Christianity. 
I think the Protestant movement was an attempt to purify and get rid of all that pagan stuff, get rid of Christmas, get rid of those sorts of, uh, and Dickens actually, even though he was not Catholic, really brought a lot of the pagan imagery back into Christmas Carol, but uh, that's part of it. Thank you, thank you, Doug. Um, next up is Madeline followed by Joe. Madeline. Yes, uh, thank you, Christian. It's a, a very rich question. Uh, to me, the um, part of the use of the mythology is that uh, it was a signifier for Dante in his personas three and four, himself as an historical person, political person, and also as creator of the work, because it was a signal that he was an educated man. And anyone who read this or heard this would know not just the common references, but it would signal to them that he had, his family had had the leisure to teach him to read. And he himself had had time um, to actually do all the reading. So it located him within society as being among the upper echelons, um, just as reference say to Dante would have in Shakespeare's time. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Madeline, next up is Joe. Yeah, I, I think that this is just, and I'm just gonna repeat what, uh, what Phil and Doug have already kind of already said in the sense that the universality of the church itself um, is the reason why. And we had actually discussed this briefly in our breakout as well. Um, and, and, you know, the idea of, of pagan hell and, and how it's pulled into it or how pagans are pulled into a Catholic hell uh, because nobody escapes that. Uh, it's, and again, it's the dogmatic approach and you can kind of see this in Dante's writings, even where it has, it is overly Catholic, even not only the dogmatic sense, but even his uh, La Vida Nova, um, where he, you know, uh, really pays, it. I get the feeling that Patrice, he's almost talking about, about the Blessed Mother in a way. He's, he's not because he cites the Blessed Mother at the end. But anyway. I don't want to get too far off the topic, but the bottom line is that I do think it's the universality of uh, the Catholic Church that he's trying to pull all these pagans into. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Tad, you've just come in. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I think it, uh, I don't disagree with any of those, but um, I also think there's a simpler answer. He's, he's, mm -hmm. he's placing himself amongst uh, the epic poets uh, Homer and Virgil, uh, Horace, uh, Ovid, obviously he places himself with them uh, early on. And I think uh, writing, incorporating their mythology is very much part of that tactic. Wonderful, that it's ex excellent point. Virgil is his guide after all. So wonderful, wonderful, excellent point. Thank you. Um, all right, next question is going to be the question that um, the, the line of thinking that Doug started. Uh, and that is reading it as a story. Um, I was wondering what people thought about that. Reading, you know, Dante as a story using images, even when you don't get all the historical uh, data. Uh, so any, any thoughts about that? Reading it as literature, reading it as a story of saying, you know, reading it for poetry, uh, Joe. I'm going to say that this is the advantage and disadvantage of maybe reading it with a group. I like, so if I, I would love to just read this as a story and just it, and enjoy it, but because it's with a group, I'm thinking about all the meaning and everything underneath it. And I'm kind of going into the details and trying to get the, the con contextual information. And to a certain extent, it takes away from the story. In that case, it, 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 it because you're actually starting to look at it from a historical point of view, a more, uh, you know, a more ed, like, uh, uh, shall I say, like educated point of view versus actually enjoying it as this story of this is what people thought hell was. Mm -hmm. And this is how you emerge from it. And this is what the church thought of hell. And these are the images that are, you know, that. Dante came up with. So for me, I, I think it's, you know, this is, 
I, I, I like the idea of reading it like a story first versus uh, going through it as an intellectual exercise, but everybody here, I guess, is too good to pass up. Okay, <laughs> so, so what, what I would suggest uh, to everybody is that everybody should read it as they see fit. That's what Doug is doing, for example. You know, He says, look, this is my take on it. This is how I want to approach it. And I think that is important. Um, and because what happens is that it's like you, you have to individually commune with these great works of art. And that is, that is very important because it depends on where you are, what is important to you, and you're going to approach it a certain way. And then come and, you know, when you're talking about your takeaways uh, in the beginning, when you say, what, what did you get out of it? You just talk about what your take is. If it is as a story, then it is as a story. If it is whatever it is, and you go ahead and speak it. And then you listen to other people because many times they will give you kind of the richness of context. So I think that kind of combination of kind of reading on your own exactly as you want, forgetting that you're reading it with a group and then coming in and actually listening to other people to see the different approaches. That's probably a very effective way of maximizing both. What, what do you think, Joe? No, I appreciate you saying that because I, you know, the, I'm trying to like kind of keep up, but I, I, I really like it just reading it as a story. Yeah. Yeah. You should, I, then you should just read it as a story and then use these as supplemental things. Yeah. Right? I, I mean, agree. and this is great supplements and they, it doesn't, and then you kind of go back and continue reading it. Wonderful. Wonderful. I Next appreciate up, it. I appreciate thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. Next up is Vanessa, Beatrice and Phil. Vanessa, what do you think, think about reading it as a story? Well, I kind of compare it to being like a spectator of a great performance, like a ballet or a symphony, or even listen to Rush, uh, Italian opera where you don't know the language. It's like you actually experience it. And I kind of compare this to when I was reading Animal Farm in high school. I had to, wait a minute, these are symbolic of real life people. You know, you kind of had the aha when you can fair realize, okay, there's more symbolism versus just trying to entertain me. And sometimes if you'd, like I said, if I'm trying to keep up with all these characters, you know, it's almost to the point, if I don't recognize the name, just go to the next stanza. So I think you get more out of it versus trying to analyze it and like it's a textbook. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Beatrice followed by Phil. Beatrice, what do you think about reading this as a story? Fantastic. Um, I found myself wanting to read it out loud by myself. It's very theatrical um, and uh, it's very easy to connect the story. This is my first time reading it to present day. This could be um, the modern uh, Orange is the New Black or Tales from Guantanamo Bay. I mean, it's so, so powerful and so dynamic and it touches uh, even on politics if we are passionate about it. So uh, it's very impressive reading. And um, even if uh, people, if English is not their first language for the English translations or, um, you know, it, it's hard, but it's, uh, well, it's worth reading. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's going to be uh, Shirley, Brian, and Phil. Shirley. Shirley, you need to unmute. There we go. Okay, very subjective, but I think he's a genius in the fact that he carries me with him so that at some of his cantos, I'm actually there, which is more than reading just a story for me. And then I go back to wherever we go, you know, whether he's narrating or something. But it's purely subjective that he carries me through some of these cantos. Shirley, I'm getting worried about you. You're saying that you thought that you were actually there? I thought you didn't want to go there. Okay. <laughs> okay. For a brief. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, just wanted to visit, not, not, not move yeah. there. Okay. But Got I it. can see it. I can see okay. it. I can okay. feel it. I, you know, he has Got that it. ability to do that. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Next up is Brian followed by Phil. Brian. Um, okay. I have been struggling for a few weeks with this because I'm reading it like it's uh, a, a poetry with an encyclopedia tagged on. And I'm getting lost in that. I'm wasting a lot of time, losing a lot of ground. So after your, I have been considering just reading, just reading it as a story. Don't bother with the encyclopedia part of it. And after your conversation with Joe just now, that's what I'm going to do. I've decided. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, next up is, uh, is Phil. I, I just wanted to say one thing. I mean, what happens is that this work, these works are so rich, is that you read it first as a story, then that kind of remains with you. Next time you're reading it, that will going to flow very naturally. And you're going to pick, pick up some pieces along the way, which are going to be integrated with the story. It's not like, I mean, this is, it is, I mean, I like Brian's characterization of it as a, a story with an encyclopedia attached to it, but it is in some ways those, that encyclopedia, this guy has managed to integrate it into the story. So you will keep getting kind of pieces and pieces of it and the story will become richer and richer. Uh, next up is going to be, let, let's go with um, uh, Phil and then Madeline. Phil. Yeah, so I, I, I'm kind of ambivalent, you know, about the story business. Uh, although I have to say one thing, this is such a multi-dimensional work that it, it almost lends itself to a variety of different ways to read it. So obviously reading it as a story is probably one way out of another hundred ways you could read it. Um, the only practical thing I would say is Dante makes it kind of hard for you to read it as a story because he keeps putting things that are not you know, the plot, you know, he, he, he put, puts in these parenthetical sections about history and geography and, you know, what, what you know, how Venetians used to build their ships and so forth. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, and this is actually born out of my own experience when I was doing this for the first time in the university, is I noticed people that read this purely as a story without really getting into the context, they saw in it whatever they wanted to see in it. Um, there was one guy who was very keen on this concept of community, a, a fellow student of mine. And he saw community everywhere in Dante. <laughs> in every concert, there was something about community. Now, nothing wrong with, with that, except that you realize that you're not actually learning what you could learn. You are taking a concept that is already dear to your heart and you're then finding it <clears throat> everywhere. And people do this all the time. Like this is the most common way I find people are reading Dante or some work that is really completely from a different era, from a different timeline. They'll, they'll read it and they'll say, oh, by the way, here is like social justice. And I'm like a big social justice you know, warrior. So I, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll jump on that. Or some other, some other theme that, that you're a patron of. And so, and that, that is okay. I mean, that's one way to read it. But I would say that what I, I enjoy about reading works that are so far removed from our own experience is actually stepping into the shoes of that time. And that, because that is such a different worldview, such a different world, such a different time. I want to be transformed or transported, like, like Shirley was saying, I want to be transformed, not to hell necessarily, <laughs> but into the viewpoint of the author who thought of it like that and understand him. And that's, that's my only sort of caveat about it. Um, uh, Phil, that was very articulately put. I mean, I think in medieval times, using the medieval terms, it would be the difference between, I'm not pronouncing this right, but exegesis versus eisegesis, right? Uh, that is really the yeah. heart of the difference, right? <laughs> Um, yeah. It's basically trying to exegesis where you're trying to very closely read what is being said using the entire context. You know, what, what does this actually say? And that's what you're trying to do. Uh, I suggest this, you're saying, okay, what is it that hits me? So it's a much more kind of subjectivist reading of it as opposed to this one. So um, it, it, uh, Phil, does that make sense to you? This district? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. All right. Uh, next up is going to be, let's see, Doug. No, sorry. Sorry. Madeline followed by Doug. Madeline. Yes. Um, I just wanted to put in uh, someone, I believe in my breakout room, had mentioned that they had read Dante many years ago and just had kind of been grinding their way through it, looking up every reference, every historical fact, all the people, everything. And so that this time when they read it, it was really a joy to read it as a story with all of that richness in mind. Wonderful, wonderful. So I just want to give you an analogy. Um, I face this when I read uh, Victor Hugo, who is one of my favorite 
probably all time favorite uh, author. Uh, he writes amazing stories, but he has this habit of going and writing an essay in the middle of the story. So it's like everything is a cliffhanger. Everything is hanging by the, and then he will say, what is the history of this place? Uh, how does it, how did it come to be? So for the longest time, I used to skip that, but then uh, in the second reading, I would, I would catch that and it would actually add real meaning to that. Uh, he is also very similar as a great artist to actually talk about his own time, uh, you know, the French Revolution time and all the context within it and integrate that context into, into the story. Doug, you're next. Yeah, I wanted to echo Phil's skepticism about the story. I need to clarify that because every story in the classical tradition, I mean, the story is sort of a Hollywood invention or a publisher's invention to make bestsellers. In the classical tradition, the ending of every story is the beginning of the next story. And then the, that story ends and another story begins. So to approach this as story, I think you have to take one to three cantos and say, what's the story? in this canto or in these two or three cantos. And it's like the Arabian Nights. I think there are stories where a character begins to tell a story and the character in that story starts to tell a story, then that story's finished, then the other story's finished and they back out of all the stories and they're wrapped up. You know, uh, and the classical, they weren't these neat monuments, the masterwork story, they were, they were all interconnected. And so I think that's, uh, I'm glad uh, Phil, expressed his skepticism about the story because I do too they they don't exist aside from anything else you know? uh, excellent point silent. yes yeah. uh, excellent point uh, Doug uh, so the next question is uh, this is the observation that uh, this is the point that uh, Phil pulled out you know art as grandchild of God so any uh, any thoughts about that well, or Doug I want to go to you first I want to want you to I, I, you know, I'd kind of like to hear some other thoughts on it because I sure. don't know much about that tradition, but I really love it, you know, that uh, and because grandchildren love their grandparents more than their parents. I think that's a very interesting thing <laughs> that art may love God more than, you know, uh, closer. And you know, grandparents like, also love their grandchildren more than their right, their, exactly. their, their children. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I like the idea, but I haven't wrapped my head around it. So I'm more really curious what other people make of it. Absolutely. So it's going to be David followed by Prudence. David. Right. This is just on the surface level. It makes a lot of sense because, you know, if we're working in a, a Christian tradition, the first generations are pretty well taken care of. That's all locked up. But if you're willing to flex a little bit and go to... Um, the, the 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 more ancient traditions you have the seven muses and those are children of divinities and it's saying we still rank expression in song and rhythm and verse and these are still sacred to the tradition because communication and logos are important and this the communication with the divine is super important and we talked about how corrupting words is getting really close to corrupting, you know, the word of God, the name itself. So um, it makes a lot of sense to me, right? Wonderful. Uh, next up is Prudence. Prudence, go ahead. Uh, Prudence, you're on mute. You need to unmute yourself. Dave took the words right out of my mouth. He said exactly what I was going to say. He is absolutely right. Um, our form is our gift from God. It's our power, power position. Um, it dictates how we're going to um, um, encompass ourselves within this realm of the world and um, if we're going to come back again and how we're coming back again. So even if we die in sin, meaning that when we come back our second life, our third life, our fourth life, we're still going to have that uh, same power or that same art of, um, of the work, meaning our body of work is what it is. It doesn't change. We never change or deviate from what our power, um, our gift was for God in its art. If we think about um, from a biblical sense, Jesus Christ was a carpenter, and that is artistic in itself. Um, you're building something from creative thought. 
you're building something from scratch. Um, there's no blueprints to these things. Um, you build as you go, and then you make the blueprints. Um, um, I had the pleasure of sitting in um, the architect, and I enjoy that as well. And that's where that concept comes from. You get to entwine, interweave everything that you see and in seeing everything, it is uh, art form. And so I'm just piggybacking off what Dave said. He is absolutely right. Um, the art form and our, our worth is from, from God and it's a, 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 um, it's a gift. So it's, when you look at it from generation to generation, it is um, the grandchild of God. Uh, wonderful, Prudence. So I, I want to uh, add to that. Uh, you, you referred to the architect, uh, you know, Louis Sullivan's Yes. Uh, work. Um, I mean, what what Louis Sullivan believed, or even what Dante believes, mm -hmm. is that you take in everything, and then you produce. You produce at the highest level. So, for example, what Dante is doing is his is the best thing that he can produce. Mm -hmm. So that's and it is a tribute to God. In the sense that it is, you know, when Louis Sullivan talks about producing something, right, or when Dante is talking about producing art. This is the most noblest thing that you can produce. Most elevated ideas that you have, bring it all together, make it real. And that's what art is. So you take in everything and you produce the best you can. So in that sense, that is your child. And because you are the child of God, that's, mm -hmm. that's your grandchild. And the grandchild better look like the, the, the granddad, you know? <laughs> yes. So that, that's the standard, you know? Yes. That, that Dante would definitely, and both Louis Sullivan would agree, agree with. Uh, wonderful. Uh, next up is going to be Shirley followed by Vanessa. Shirley. Yes, just a quick thing. I think Dante explains it very well. He says that um, as far as art is, it's able and it follows nature. <laughs> wonderful. And Thank you. Exactly. Next up is Vanessa. Vanessa, what do you think about art being the grandchild of I can God? I agree with that. And also I'm trying to think like first generation, I think of that saying, you must first learn to crawl before you can walk. And it also describes kind of like first generation nature and being inspired by maybe the divine intellect. So if you kind of look at that, maybe, you know, first generational, then we're born from nature. And then, you know, we're inspired by that to make our own artwork. Yeah. Wonderful. So we'll take last two questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. We'll take last two questions. Uh, one by um, one which was raised by Mike. And then the last we will end with uh, the idea of the medieval mindset, because that permeates this entire work. And if you you really need to understand what that is, in order to fully appreciate it. Um, so Mike, I don't know whether we're going to do justice to your question. Your question was about what is you know dante's uh, comedy based on what what work is it bible is it some other version of it i don't know if there are people here uh, so anybody who wants to answer that what is the base of that could you go ahead and type an exclamation mark in chat i, I can take some of that i guess sorry i didn't put uh, let, let's uh, uh, mike is saying something mike what is your answer and then well, you can uh, I, I didn't pipe in very much because Phil was in our breakout session and he answered it in spades. So, and OK, so then I'll let can, you. He can probably summarize the answer and some additional questions that came up better than I could. Because Wonderful. He, Thank he you. He has a better command of the English language than I do. I, I doubt that, Mike, your, you, your English is pretty good. I know Phil's English is great. But I don't think, and, and your, your range of knowledge is, is amazing. So Mike, don't put yourself down. Phil, but Phil, Phil, uh, all the positive things you said about Phil, I fully agree with. Phil, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, as far as the sources for Dante, uh, this actually um, is, there, there are several. So Bible is just one of them. It's the obvious one, the, you know, and, and of course there's, We've seen some references to the book of Revelation. We've seen some references to Daniel, the, the prophecies of Daniel with the beast, and, and also the, 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 um, that human, uh, the old man of Crete. You know, that's also obviously a reference to the prophecy in Daniel. 
Uh, but the other, the other sources are Aristotle. Uh, so it's not just, you know, again, it's not just the Christian tradition, it's the classical tradition. And that's the beauty of it is that there, there's this confluence of these two traditions. Um, that, so Aristotle's ethics, Aristotle's um, uh, uh, politics uh, is all part of this. Uh, the other one, of course, is Aquinas, the Summa Theologiae, which was the seminal work in the medieval times, essentially does a lot for Dante already. Uh, what Aquinas did is he did integrate Aristotle's ideas on ethics with the Christian ideas on ethics. And it was actually a beautiful, beautiful uh, sort of uh, synthesis of the, of the two thoughts. So, but the other, we, we talked about this in, in our group as well, um, in, our, in our breakout room rather, um, that this is, a po this is a poetic work. This is a literature, it's fiction, right? So it's not a theological treatise. And therefore an artist like Dante can take a single verse in the Bible and run with it and create all kinds of things that are never, <laughs> you would never find in the Bible, you know, or, or anywhere else for that matter, because he's imagining things, right? This idea of the suicides, as, as shrubs and all the rest of it. I mean, it's completely, uh, I mean, it's a, obviously you can, there are some references to, to even the Aeneid in there, but it's, it's an invention, right? That, that he, he has, that's his genius. So some of it is completely fictional, uh, which is why it's so interesting. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Um, just quick question for you, uh, Phil. What is the, um, was Dante very familiar with Aquinas? Certainly, certainly he was. Was they he were contemporaries almost? I mean, I mm -hmm. think Aquinas was just maybe a couple of years earlier than him. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, he almost—I don't want to say quotes, but he definitely refers to several, several. You know, the way Summa Theologia is laid out, it's a question and answer, just like what yes. we're doing right now. So, in some of some of these sessions with Virgil, where Virgil explains things to him, it's almost exactly referring to certain parts of nice. Summa Theologia. Wow. Okay, excellent. Uh, next up is David. David, go ahead. Right. But on a sort of different aspect of that question, one little thing, which is about the idea of taking a long trip to do an ex exposition of structures of things. This is preceded by the Canterbury Tales. This is preceded by the Odyssey. So we have stories of a trip which has a meaning as it occurs and it unfolds different adventures to be chapters which display certain characteristics of the person taking the trip or in this case, the structure of the spiritual world. So there are, there are literary precedents too. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, so last question is going to be about the medieval mindset. Uh, so the question is, do you see the medieval mindset in Dante? How is his way of thinking different than way of thinking of yourself and people around, around us in today's culture? So any thoughts? You can go ahead and type exclamation mark if you'd like to talk about this. Okay, I don't see any exclamation marks. So let's see. Um, so it's gonna be Vanessa and then I would like uh, Doug and Phil to comment on it. Uh, if you have any, any comments. Uh, Vanessa, go ahead. I definitely do see influence of the middle ages when it's talking about you know virtue and valor. And then that, um, one of the later cantos we read was talking about the coat of arms that were displayed. Mm -hmm. So you see bits and pieces. If you've ever gone to, you know, the Renaissance Fair or anything like that, you mm -hmm. say, "Oh, this is familiar." So I definitely see um, uh, reflections of it. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Next up is Tad. Tad, go ahead. Hi. I, I think. Um, I mean, particularly the cantos we're talking about. The thing. The thing that is really dis distinctive about about this being of of its time is the the punitive nature of death um and how the death death is um you know when when you when you get to, to shakespeare's time uh all of a sudden death becomes all these different things and there's so many so many new words for it and so many ways of talking about the worms and the dust mm -hmm. and 
and uh, Memento Mori and all that stuff emerges out of out of this long period that Dante was in when 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 death was was this uh, very punitive uh, way that God chose who goes where and who has what sort of uh, uh, you know what sort of punishment based on their particular sins or the way that they live their life and I think that construct is something that we still have a bit of um, but it's very specific to that time and obviously he incorporates it a lot uh, and the other thing that's that that really dominates his his way of thinking about that era has to do with the the uh, internecine battles between the Guelphs and the Ghibellinis and the Blacks and the Whites and the uh, the sort of town to town infighting that's going on with these royal families and the the Roman Church. So I think I, to me those are the things that are most distinctive of the era. Wonderful, uh, Tad. Looks like you're very familiar with Dante. I I don't know about that, but I'm learning. <laughs> okay, wonderful, wonderful. Excellent. Thank you, Tad. Great, great observations. Uh, next up is going to be Mike, and then Doug and Phil. Mike. One of the things that I think has already been mentioned, but uh, <clears throat> the Crusades were going on uh, approximately the same time, and uh, bishops and cardinals and uh, local parish priests were offering absolution for the most heinous sins if you would go on the Crusades. And so the thought of uh, how you'd burn in hell was uh, uh, in, in, in the minds of a lot of people at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, Doug, do you have any thoughts about the medieval mindset here? Uh, yeah, I have a question about the idea of the medieval mindset, because the more I try to research into it, it's a, depending on what country you're in, it's a very, very different and varied period and much richer than we imagine it as the Dark Ages. There's a history of science um, from the teaching company called, I think, the History of Science from Antiquity to 1700 by Lawrence Principe or something. It's very interesting. He describes a mural that's, I think, a medieval mural, and it's scholars and priests arguing ferociously in this mural, very actively engaged in debate. And that's not an image we have of the medieval period where everything's sort of holy. Uh, and so I think there are many medieval mindsets. For four mm -hmm. or 500 years in Spain, there was a blending of Islamic, Christian, and Jewish music, mysticism, poetry that was very fruitful that didn't enter the rest of Europe until the Renaissance is sort of mm -hmm. when it started to come in while they were throwing the Jews and Moors out of Spain. Mm -hmm. And Excellent. then they went to London, they went to Venice and changed those cities by, by kind of a diaspora. So it's... Uh, I think there are different mindsets. In different yeah, countries. excellent, excellent point. Uh, uh, I mean, the thing is that the, the given histo that historical time, the divisions between these countries and the cultures, difference in cultures between the countries at a given time are, are very different uh, from, from each other. Ex excellent point. Uh, next up is Phil. Phil, uh, any closing thoughts about the medieval? Yeah, mindset? yeah. Actually, I wanted to show you guys a book that might illustrate uh, some of this medieval mindset and how it's different from ours. Uh, if you have, uh, hmm. my, uh, yeah, yes. Uh huh. The, what, what this is? It's a it's a translation of a medieval manuscript called the Bestiary or the Bestiary. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but basically, it's just a. Um, what we might call a natural history book about animals. But when you read it, you don't just read about like what you expect to read, which is like, you know, wolf and, you know, he lives here and he does this, he eats that. But wait, what you read after you read about that part, which is the normal part that we're, we're accustomed to, you would read something like, what is the symbolical meaning of wolf as an animal and it, or, or a lion or a leopard? And then pretty much any kind of animal you would have. And so this is so completely different from our thinking because we don't think in those terms. We don't think that a lion means anything beyond being a lion. I mean, just an animal that evolved. You know, we don't think of it as having some, some eternal meaning, but that's how they, they thought about things. And, and again, or numbers. 
why is number three somehow more special than number six or 11? In our mind, we wouldn't think that, but in their mind, every number and every animal and everything is, has this additional dimension that is alive and connected and full of meaning. And that's why they also had this concept of, or the phenomenon rather, of illustrated manuscripts. You, you open a book, a medieval book, and it has a letter on it, but then under that letter, something might be crawling <laughs> that's actually pertaining to what you're gonna be reading about. And why is that? Well, because it's alive. It's not just a letter or a book. It's actually, there's some life in it. And, and, and so in Dante's, uh, I guess, uh, when you read Inferno, I also, I can't get away from that, from that concept that everything is connected. Everything is architected. It's all this intricate thing. It's nothing is random. You know, why are orbits circular in their mindset? Because it's perfect. They're perfect. They're not elliptical like we we know they are today because ellip ellipses are not perfect, but circles are perfect. Why are there seven planets? Why didn't they discover Jupiter, you know, in medieval times? Because they weren't looking for it. There were only seven planets. And, you know, eighth planet would kind of mess it all up. <laughs> you know? So so anyway, uh, it's this magical thinking, this it's very interesting. It's like fairy tale in some ways. It reminds you of a fairy tale, but it's kind of, in some ways it's silly. We think of it maybe as a little bit silly, but in some ways it's very rich and appealing, like a fantasy world. And that's, that's I mean, it's, I guess we're talking about di different ways to read Dante. It's a way to almost like jog your imagination because we don't, we don't do that very often. Yeah. We're so rational and mm -hmm. so you know, down to earth. But in Dante, it's all magical. You have all these you know, trees that are suicides and they're all like, you break off a branch and instead of you know, something magical happens, <laughs> and then you have a fire raining from heaven and you know, things that just don't happen. Wonderful. Uh, Phil, um, you know, Rosella, Doug, and you did a fantastic job today. And I think uh, everybody lo lo looks like lots of people are reading it and I love the commentary. But Phil, especially uh, today, you know, you, your observations were just incredible at many, many different levels. So really, really appreciate that. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. And folks, uh, next one is going to be about a month from now. We're going to announce it. Uh, it, it should be there on the web page already. So you can go ahead and uh, and check it out. We'll we'll go ahead and uh, do you know, uh, Phil, which cantos we'll be covering? I think we're, we're going to to the end. Okay. Uh, so it's okay. 30, uh, 20, 24 30, onwards, 34. Yeah, 24 to the end. OK, of yeah. Inferno. OK. All right, folks. So thank you very much. And we will see you soon.